I don't know if, like me, you were really impacted by that testimony of Alexei Navalny. Um, I hadn't picked up that he was even a believer until Caroline said something last week, and I, I thought, oh, really? I wonder where that comes from. Um, when somebody speaks from experience of doing it and quotes, you know, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, you think, you know, that it comes with an authority, doesn't it? And I didn't know that Gordon was going to share that this morning, but I wanted to start with that. We hunger and thirst for righteousness because we look around and we don't see it in our world. Um, the, the newspaper headlines are depressing, but actually many of you have connections to nations that never make the headlines, and you know that things are pretty depressing there as well. Many of you are involved in projects here in the UK, maybe CAP, maybe others, where you know that things here in the UK are more depressing than the headlines as well. There is a lack of righteousness and justice in our world. It is not improved through the human project, much as it's, it's laudable to seek to relieve poverty. It's laudable to seek to bring peace, to take aid to places that are suffering um, to seek to regenerate farming in areas that are hit by famine and drought. All of these things are laudable, but on its own, it is not resolving righteousness and justice. And I wonder if dry ground is perhaps a good metaphor for this. You might remember a few summers ago, it became so dry in the UK and so hot that the ground just cracked. We even saw burn marks, do you remember, of like underground buildings, which they didn't even know were there, because where there was stone deep underground from foundations, the, the top reacted differently. That's how deep the, uh, the effect of the, of the sun and the drought was, was having effect. Maybe you've seen pictures of somewhere like Death Valley in the USA, where things have become so dry, the ground cracks and all the plants die. And... I want to just start today's already somber passage uh, by saying this is the situation we are in. We are hungering and thirsting for righteousness because God has made us in his image and at the very core of us we have a desire to see what God is like here on earth and he is righteous and he is just and we want to see it in our world and that is why it grieves us when we look around and we see a lack of it and our land is crying out for a flood. Isaiah talks about, well, in the words of, of God, I will pour water on a dry and thirsty ground and streams of water in the desert. It's actually a picture that comes up a few times in Isaiah, water on thirsty ground. And what we're looking at today, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be quite hard hitting. It's going to be quite somber. And yet also there's a promise in here that when Jesus returns, he will bring righteousness and justice not just temporarily not just fixing one situation not just fixing five situations but he will bring lasting righteousness and justice he brings the flood that truly revives the ground so that it can be fruitful again so as we hear hard truths this morning from Jesus's mouth, let's remember as well that the thing we're looking forward to is the one who is saying these hard words, returning to make everything right. He comes to bring the flood to the dry ground. This passage and last week's passage go together. David spoke last week on the, the signs of the end of the age, and it starts off with the disciples talking to Jesus about the incredible temple buildings. They, they would have been beyond belief. I don't know if you've stood next to the Shard uh, or maybe the Empire State Building or something like that and looked up and just been overwhelmed by the size of it. But we're used to seeing big buildings and that the temple in Jerusalem was just beyond belief in terms of size and glamour um, and grandeur. And so these disciples were overawed and they're commenting on it to Jesus and and Jesus talks about not one stone being left on top of another and so when they go up and sit on the Mount of Olives they ask him a sort of a double question when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age and last week David's um, talk was about the, what Jesus says to the second part of that what will be the signs does anyone remember what were some of the signs that Jesus spoke of 
that he was coming again? What were some of the signs of the end of the age? Just shout them out. It's not a trick question. It's the things you remember when you think about it. Pestilence, yes. Plague, absolutely. Wars and rumors of wars, absolutely. Seen a few of those. Earthquakes. Nations rising against nations. Signs in the heavens and on the earth below. The moon turning to blood. Remember these ones? Okay, so, sorry? False prophets, yes, David spoke about that as well, didn't he? False prophets, people claiming to come in Jesus' name or to be him, but not being him. Absolutely. And so that was, that was Jesus' answer to the second part. And now we go back to the first part. When will this happen? Now, some things that Jesus teaches in this passage are a bit complicated to unpick. They take a lot of turning over. They take comparing with other parts of the scripture to bring them to light. But some things are incredibly clear. Over the years, many people have tried to predict when Jesus would come again. If you've ever gone to Wikipedia and looked for predictions of the end of the world, which I did this week, uh, any guesses on how many predictions of dates of the end of the world there have been just that we've got recorded on Wikipedia, which obviously is a subset? Any guesses? A couple of hundred, spot on. Yeah, a couple of hundred. Do you know what really, really annoys me about it is almost all of them are Christians. Okay, it's one thing to say that Mayans had this calendar and when the calendar ran out in 2012, they might have thought the end of the age was coming because that was just based around the calendar. Although actually, apparently, if you really know your Mayan studies, they didn't really think that. But Christians follow Jesus and Jesus says, about that time, nobody knows. And some people go, yeah, but they didn't count on me doing some maths. <laughs> it, it's, it's ridiculous, okay? And I, ju I just want to say this. I, I hope nobody here is caught up in this. But there are people, and there have been people over the centuries, there will still be people who will say, ah, oh, yes, but I know that if you add up all the numbers that you get in Genesis 36 and multiply them by the number of the beast, what you get is the date that Jesus is coming back. And it's just not true. Jesus is really clear. Nobody knows. In fact, Jesus, being in very nature God, but taking on some of the limitations of being human, says, even I do not know, only the Father. Okay? So anybody who claims to know, they're putting themselves above Jesus, let's not have any of it. Okay? We do not know when Jesus is coming back, other than that it is going to happen. And it will be when we don't expect it. Okay? We don't know, we're not supposed to. That's the whole point. Jesus gives three pictures to explain this. Three illustrations. The first one is Noah and the flood. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. Those of you here who are married, do you remember the lead up to your wedding? Do you remember how all-consuming it was? Like, nothing else, in, uh, there will be some exceptions to this, but for most of you, nothing else really kind of registered it was like everything was leading towards this day and the planning for what came after, the honeymoon, you know, last minute photographer stuff and, and flowers and venue and, and have we invited everybody and, and everything just leads up to this. And, and the point Jesus is making here is that inescapable judgment in the form of the flood came in the middle of things that people thought surely this is the center of the world. I, I remember just sort of everything feeling like it centered around Caroline and I in that moment, even though obviously it didn't. But, you know, surely, surely Jesus couldn't come back before this happens because this is really the thing. Okay, I'm being a bit honest here. I'm, I'm getting some smiles, which might be judgment or might be sympathy. I don't know. <laughs> but, but the point is it comes in the middle of that. There would have been people who were going to get married next day, two days away, and then the flood came and washed it all away. It was when they did not expect it, and it was inescapable. This is the point Jesus is making about his second coming. It, it does bring judgment. It's inescapable. You can't hide. Does anyone know the song Cinnamon by Nina Simone? 
Yeah. Have a listen sometime. Nina Simone raised in a Christian household, but herself walked away from it. And she carries this deep angst in her, which comes out in that song, Cinnamon, um, about the day of judgment coming and her running to the rocks and saying, rocks, hide me. And they're like, well, I'm not going to hide you. Where were you when you should have been praying? It's just, it's interesting, you know, hearing that come out. But it will be inescapable. You won't be able to hide under a rock from Jesus' judgment. You won't be able to hide under your bed or under the covers you won't be able to put on a disguise. It's inescapable. And it will come when we least expect it, in the middle of stuff. There, there will be people in the middle of things when Jesus comes again. It could be me in the middle of a sermon that I never get to preach, even though I prepared for it. You know, it could be you in that work presentation that you've been working towards for six months, you know, pitching to a client. It could be just before that birthday party that you spent ages prepping for. It could be the day before you retire. And you've made all these plans for your retirement and Jesus comes again. You know, it, it, it will interrupt stuff inevitably. And it will be unexpected. And then Jesus picks up particularly on that lack of expectation because he says, if you knew when a thief was coming, you'd be watching out, wouldn't you? Has anyone here been burgled? Yeah. Yeah, and I, I don't want to make you relive those memories. But if you... If you knew when the thief was coming, it wouldn't work. You'd be waiting. You'd have the police waiting, whatever it would be. Jesus is saying, we need to be constantly ready. If you're not constantly ready, the thief will catch you out. And then he goes on to give a third illustration about a faithful and wise servant and one who's less so. The faithful and wise servant is put in charge of the master's household to give them their food at the proper time. But there's the temptation, as the master takes a long time to return, the temptation to say to yourself, he's not coming back anytime soon. I could just raid the larder. I could beat the other servants. I could do what I like, get drunk, have a sleep on the master's bed, whatever it might be. Do you know, I, there's, there's lots in what Jesus says that makes it sound as though he's going to come back in like five years or ten years from when he speaks it. But I love here, he, he foresees the time we live in now when people say, I thought Jesus was coming back. It's been 2,000 years. Are you, you sure about this, guys? That's the temptation in us not to be ready. It's been so long since Jesus said these things. Why would it be tomorrow? If he is coming back, surely it'll be a while away. And Jesus says, this is exactly the moment when you'll be tempted to let it slip, to not be ready, because it's been a while, because it doesn't look like there's any reason why it should be tomorrow or today or five days time. Now's the time when the temptation is strong not to be ready. And to Derek, uh, Derelict? You can't derelict your duty, can you? To be derelict in your duty, we'll go with that. And the duty, what, what's the master left to do? He's left to feed the other servants, to be put in charge of the house. You know, God has given us responsibilities. He's given us responsibilities to care for one another, to encourage one another in the faith. He's given us responsibilities to the world that we live in. He's given us responsibilities to act as faithful servants of what he's put in our charge. What he's put in your charge could be your finances, your family, the workplace he's set you in, your political clout, your place on the village council. I don't know what it is for you, but God has given you all responsibilities, just as he's given me responsibilities. Live them out as a faithful servant of the Lord. Don't be tired of it, because he's coming back, and who knows when. And when he does, won't it be a joy to have Jesus say, I gave you that, and when I came back, you were hard at work. There's a promise elsewhere of that greeting, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what I want to compete for. You know, I've been taking to thinking about what is it I fall asleep thinking about at night? Like, what is, what is that peaceful, pleasant thought that allows me to sink into sleep. I don't know about you, my, my mind just likes to go on full and it sort of, I, I can relax nicely in the evening and about five minutes before bed, suddenly all the things that like rob me of peace suddenly go, hey, you should think about me. 
<laughs> Why don't you fall asleep thinking about it? And, and, and I don't fall asleep. And what, what is that thing which brings peace and calm? And I've decided the thing that most does that is to reflect on what it will be like for Jesus to say, well done, good and faithful servant to me. I want to commend that to you. It doesn't have to be last thing before bed. But like picture that moment. What will it be like for Jesus to come back and say, well done? If our eyes are on that, we'll be faithful. Jesus goes on to talk about being taken and being left behind. Um, this is one of a couple of passages in the scriptures that have been interpreted as referring to something called the rapture, uh, which according to that view, then uh, Jesus, before he returns to judge the world, there's this time when living believers will be kind of taken out of the world. And uh, 1 Thessalonians says, we'll meet him in the air. And the world is left without them for some time. You may know there was that series Left Behind, Tim LaHaye. Some of you will have read it. Uh, there was a film of it as well. It appears in various popular media. Look, read the passage for yourself. We're going to be studying Revelation next as well. So, you know, read Revelation, see what it says, and come to your own conclusion. Personally, I don't think this is talking about that. But whatever conclusion you come to, it's not what Jesus is primarily teaching here. You know, it may be right. I think Jesus very clearly doesn't explain exactly what it's going to be like for him to come back. I think he leaves an awful lot for us to find out. What Jesus is answering is when, and the answer is in the middle of daily life when you least expect it. So this passage which talks of um, two women grinding at a mill together and one being taken and the other left, and two men walking up a hill and one being taken and the other left, isn't primarily talking about Jesus literally lifting people out of this world and leaving the earth sort of without all living believers. That's not what he's on about. What he's, what he's talking about is it will be in the middle of daily life when you least expect it, and it will divide people who are in other ways together. It will divide those who believe in the Lord from those who do not. That's what he's teaching. Whether it will look like what some people describe as the rapture or not, honestly, I don't think this passage teaches us. I don't think 1 Thessalonians teaches us, which talks about being caught up into the air. I don't think we know, and I think we should be honest about it. That's my personal view, but I'm, I'm not going to stop you having the liberty to think what you think about it. What he does teach is a separation, unexpected, between those who believe and those who do not in the middle of daily life. So, why does Jesus teach his disciples this? It's the last week before he's crucified and raised from the dead. Why is it so important in this last week that he uses his precious time with his disciples to at quite some length talk about this to them? I want to suggest the main reason is that we're supposed to live as though it was any time now. Jesus could have been really clear. He could have said, listen guys, 2,000 years at least are going to go past. People are going to say, I'm never coming back, but I am. Don't worry about it. But he didn't. Because he wanted his disciples to live as though he was going to come back any day. And he wanted people in the 300s to live as though he could have come back any day. And he wanted people in the 1500s to believe that he could have come back any day. And he wanted us today to believe that he could have come back any day and that it might be today. That's how he wants us to live, in that state of readiness, and so he has to leave it open-ended. And he wants us to understand the urgency of the gospel. If there's something that comes out really, really clearly through last week's passage, this week's passage, the ones we're looking at next week as well, it's the urgency of the gospel. I started off by talking about dry ground, so dry that it's become cracked, and water that you tip on it just runs off, and what you need is something that floods the ground until it is soft again. The trouble with floods is that floods themselves bring their own problems, don't they? The picture I had for us this morning is we live in this dry, cracked ground. We need the floods of Jesus returning and bringing righteousness and justice to everybody. But when that happens, you'll need a lifeboat. 
But Jesus has given us the lifeboat. And this is why he uses the picture of the ark, right? God rescues Noah from judgment. God will rescue us from judgment, but who else belongs in the boat? Who is it that you know who currently does not believe in Jesus and currently, therefore, will, in that time of judgment, be on the wrong side of it? Our mission in this world, a reason for God planting us here in Wheatley, in Forest Hill, in Garsington, in Horse Path, wherever you are, our reason, Tame, um, you know, Tiddington, keep, keep adding to the list, a <laughs> little applause over there. The reason for God planting us there is there are people in our communities that he wants in the lifeboat who are not there yet. We didn't earn our place in the lifeboat. They don't earn their place in the lifeboat, but they need someone to tell them. And they might need somebody to, to walk with them for a while until they understand that they need to get into the lifeboat. Do you see what I mean? This is our calling as a church. And to do that, we need to really believe that Jesus is coming back. We need to believe that it could be any time now. And we need to believe that it really will be a sharp divide between those who believe in Jesus and those who don't. I know as a community, I know that we're compassionate people and we like to think, oh, surely, surely there's a way that God would save more people than just those who believe in Jesus. Actually, at the root of it, that's a proud thought. We can't be more compassionate than God. But he's got to bring justice. He's got to bring righteousness. And that means judgment as well as salvation. So our prayer should not be, God, would you just be a bit more merciful than, than you say? Our prayer should be, God, please, would you rescue these people who we love, who you've put us living next to in our families, in our extended families? I suppose there's a, a moment of sobriety here to say, are you in the lifeboat as well? Like when the flood comes, you don't want to have one foot in, one foot out. Here's what it is to be saved. To have confessed your sin to Jesus and asked him to forgive you. To commit that he is the Lord of your life. Not you, not anybody else, but Jesus is the Lord of your life. And to commit to following him. Then you're in because of his power, because of his forgiveness, you're in. And that's what we're also offering to other people. And there's, there's so much more than that. There's, there's what it is to live with the Lord. There's the joy of belonging to him. There's daily relationship. There's strength when you're weak. All of these things. But at the core of it is, are you in the lifeboat? Because Jesus has made a way for it. In just a few minutes, we're going to pray for some people. You know, I'm, I'm thinking of close family members at the moment. Um, you will have friends, family, maybe children, maybe cousins, neighbors. Um, but we're going to listen to a song. And it's a song written by a chap called Larry Norman. Those of you whose Christian music history goes back a little way might know him. He was one of the pioneers of the possibility that rock music didn't have to be satanic and that actually you could be a follower of Jesus and play rock music. Um, but he wrote this song based on Matthew 24 called I Wish We'd All Been Ready. And for me, it kind of lands in my heart that longing, that longing for more people to be ready, that longing to be ready myself, but for, for more people to be ready. Let's listen to this, and then I'm going to hand back to Gordon to lead us in prayer. Let's pray together. I want to start by saying that if you are one of the people Al referred to who's maybe got one leg in the lifeboat and one leg not, and now's a good time to get in. Lord, you call us all to join you, to follow you. 
Your call is clear. Your call raises our hope and our hearts. If that's us at the moment, if we're just not sure, help us to see clearly your hands stretched out in front of us, calling us home. If that's you, come home to the Father who will forgive, embrace, and love you.